Well, welcome back to our journey through the book of Psalms. Specifically, we are looking at the Psalms of Ascent. I love this collection of writings because it speaks to us what it's like for a pilgrim who is on a journey to a place of worship to prepare themselves and get their hearts ready to enter in to the place, the geographic location, but the heart attitude of worship. And that's what one-tenth of all the psalms have to deal with. These are called the psalms of ascent because literally what they're doing is they are ascending up the mountain to get to the city of Jerusalem to worship. I don't know where you came from to, to your journey to get here today, but there was some kind of travel that you had to do to get to the place of worship. In ancient Israel, it was that they had to climb the mountain to get to the top, which was where the city of Jerusalem was located, and the temple was there. And so the Psalms of Ascent, if I were on these steps, was like every step they would take, there would be another song that they would sing, Psalms of Ascent. They were actually ascending all the way up until they got to the top, the pentacle. Psalm 134 is the top. It is the last one in this collection of 15 psalms. Today, we're going to look at Psalm 133, which gets us just close enough that they can see the worship. They can hear the sounds. They can smell the aroma of all the sacrifices. They knew what was happening, and they are just about ready to get to the place of worship. That's where I want us to get in heart and mind today is what is it like to just get our hearts ready, to be at the precipice, be right at the point of getting to that place of worship? Can you feel it? Can you feel the anticipation building for getting to the house of God, to getting to that place where we're finally going to release our worship, our sacrifice, our offerings, and our giving of thanks unto God? I like this collection of Psalms because it speaks to us in a very real way how each of us are on a journey. We are just pilgrims passing through. And these collection of Psalms actually speak about what it meant to beat back the barbarians and those elements that were hindering them from worship. Anybody ever feel hindered every now and then from your worship? Anybody ever feel that there is just a struggle, it seems like, to get into that place of really dedicating our heart and our life to God? But there is this joy that comes knowing that it's going to be worth it all, that when we finally get there, it will be worth it all because we now stand in the presence of God. But we're not there yet. We have to see this, this last piece until we get there next week and find out what does it mean to get our hearts ready to worship God. Let's look at Psalm 133. There's only three verses today. So these three verses have so much packed into them. I want us to really focus on the key theme of these verses. It says this, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Everybody say unity. It is like the precious oil upon the beard running down on, uh, upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. Now I want to read this again, these, these three verses in the message translation. I, I want you to see how it just colors it just a little bit different. Here it is. How wonderful, how beautiful, when brothers and sisters get along. Let's say that again. When brothers and sisters get along. It's like costly anointing oil flowing down head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. It's like dew on Mount Hermon, flowing down the slopes of Zion. You see this? They're going up, they're ascending up, but now it's all flowing down. They say what goes up must come down. That, yes, that's where God commands the blessing. I want you to say that with me together, the blessing. So the theme of this is going to be unity and blessing. It says that's where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. Unity brings a command, a command of God under the umbrella of unity is that there is a blessing there. And, and in our worship, what I want you to see is that 
in worship, we come together as a community. We take this word unity and, and we compound it many times to other words. But I want you to see that in community, there is life. But in disunity, there is dying. I didn't say death. There is dying. When we come together, we, we form a community of faith, a fellowship in this local body. This is not the only church. We are but a member of his body. There are people worshiping all around the globe today. Thanks be to God, lifting up praise in the name of Jesus, the same God and Father of our faith. So we understand that we are just but a, a member of this body. We form a very important alliance in this community. But as a faith community, when we come together, there is a blessing of life. But if we are disjointed, if we are disconnected, if somehow we get a little bit off and, and we're not quite operating as we should, then it brings about a dying process. Not death, because death is final. And for those of you who have ever had to sit by the bedside or watch someone with a protracted illness, something that has been deemed by the medical community as incurable, untreatable, unsustainable to give life long, and someone is in a dying spiral, that death process, it can sometimes be a long and painful road. And when you walk that road with someone, you recognize the, the decline and, and the deficiencies and the faculties of, of a person, and it's, it's, it's just heartbreaking. And that's exactly the broken heart that the psalmist had when he's talking about when we come together, but we're disunified, what happens is that we've entered into this death spiral. We're not going to be taken out today, but eventually with no life coming into our being, we don't have the sustenance needed to bring forth the unity and the blessing. However, it's beautiful. It's wonderful, he says, when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. There. God commands the blessing. When I think of beautiful ideas or landscapes in, in our life, I think of how that God has blessed us with nature to speak beauty. You know, God speaks to us in so many different ways. The beauty of nature, the beauty of scenery, the beauty of artwork, the beauty of music. There are so many different beautiful things that are happening all around our world. And we can find a glimmer, a glimpse of God in all of those things speaking to us. It's, it was said by C.S. Lewis that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. Our pain are those moments of disunity, of disjointedness. But God is speaking a blessing when we come together in a place of worship like this and we give our homage to the Lord. We give our thanks and we give our praise to God. The Philippian writer said it like this in verse eight of chapter four, finally, brethren, he gets all the way to the end of his book and he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What are you thinking about today? What are you meditating on? What is on your mind? More than just the message that's being preached or the songs that we just sung, it's so easy to, to get sidetracked, to get a wayward in our thoughts and to tune out what's happening. But think on the good things. Think on the unifying things. This is what the psalmist is telling us, is that you are so close to the place of worship, you cannot afford distraction. You cannot afford to be taken away and carried away with wayward thoughts. You need to focus on this. This is the most important moment of your life for right now is your place of worship. And I love how the message says, when brothers and sisters get along. Brothers and sisters getting along is a blessing to the heart of any parent, is it not? I mean, there is something that makes a parent's heart smile when they know that their children are getting along. But there is nothing worse in a household than tension and strife and turmoil and children who are fighting and at, at odds all the time. Because mom and dad can't simply just pick favorites and say, well, you just need to get along with them because I like them better. No, that's not the way it works. There is this tension on the parent's heart when their children don't get along because they can't just simply pick favorites. They love them all. They love both of them. They love all of their children. And, and some would say the same, but it's also in different aspects and in different characteristics and different ways. 
But Father God's heart is so pleased when his children get along. When brothers and sisters get along and they're in unity, there is a smile on the face of God. There is a commanded blessing on the children of God when we all get in unity. When our community gets in unity. Now, I can worship on my own, and I do oftentimes. I I can be the best soloist in my car with my volume on about 32, going down the road, singing at the top of my lungs. Any other car soloists we got in here this morning? All right, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm in good company. But I won't sing like that up here on this stage. I'm not going to be quite that in community. Although a couple weeks ago, I asked for a special request on our, on our microphone system, and it was midweek, and we had uh, someone out, and someone else was filling in, and, and they actually got my request backwards, and they ended up keeping my headset mic on the entire service. And I didn't know it until after service, someone in the band came up and said, Boy, it was real pretty singing you were doing for us today. I said, what are you talking about? They're like, we heard everything you were singing right there on the front row is in our in-ear microphones. <laughs> and I had this thought to myself, I'm really glad that after service, after the first service in the hallway, I wasn't talking bad about the members like I normally do. <laughs> because that would have been a broadcast for everybody. There are times when I want to worship God in such zeal and such exuberance that I'll do it in a private setting. But there is something else that activates when I come together with like-minded people and we can together as the people of God lift up our hands without wrath and doubt and say, you are holy, O Lord. To you deserves all glory and honor and praise both now and forevermore. And we come together, not because we can all sing beautifully, but because we have all been called under this banner of love. His banner over me is love. And I want to be in fellowship and community with my brothers and sisters. I want to get along with my brothers and sisters. Not only my my natural siblings, that brings a smile to my natural parents' hearts, but how about my brothers and sisters in Christ? How blessed, how unifying it is to get along with brothers and sisters. And I can think of the psalmist here, and I bring it into 21st century vernacular. It's almost like this is the scene that is set for us when mom and dad have the kids in the car and they're on their way to New Freedom Church. They turn onto Miller Road. The speed limit is 35, but they're just a tad late, so they're going about 51. When they spin in on two wheels into the parking lot, dad looks back and says, hey, now, y'all, knock it off. Stop that fussing and fighting. We're just about to church. You got to get ready now. We're going to worship. Put a smiley face on because you're probably going to see the greeter at the door and you might just shake the preacher's hand. You don't want to act up for the kid's church director. Knock it off in the backseat. That's about like what the psalmist is saying. He's saying how beautiful, how blessed is it when God's people, when brothers and sisters get along. Maybe today God is challenging you through this psalm to finally and forever bury that hatchet. Now, some of y'all buried the hatchet, but you left the handle sticking out of the ground and you're tripping over that every single time you take a path back that way. It's time to finally let the offense go. It's time to finally let the person who offended you be set free. And in so doing, you will be set free because you know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is freedom of you, not necessarily taking them off the hook. God will deal with them. Know this, vengeance is God's and he said he'll repay. So if you have an ought between a brother or sister, you need to recognize if they name the name of Jesus, then you don't need to be arguing and tussling and fighting with them because daddy God doesn't like to see his kids fighting. But what you can do is you can be the bigger one. You can take the high road. And here's what I've been told about the high road is that there's never a traffic jam on the high road. You can go as fast as you want, as far as you desire, because that is God's path. And it's time for us to let go of the things that have hindered us from worship. He's saying, hey, you're right here. One more step and you are in the house of God. You are going to be worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let all that other stuff go. Start getting along because in this unified way, God commands the blessing. Once you get there, if you brought all that junk and you're turmoil and all these things in your mind, you are going to be hindered. 
You're not going to be able to enter in the way that I want you to enter in. Now, I know because I do it too. We come into work We come into life, we come into the store, we come into church, we come into family gatherings with junk on our minds. We all have issues, we all have problems. We shouldn't be embarrassed about things that that are happening in our lives because you search long enough and someone has a little bit of outlaws in their family too, amen. Someone has someone in their family that's a little wayward too. And I know that we all do it, we bring in things to the house of God, and this is exactly where you need to bring it. But listen, you need to bring it so that you can leave it. Don't ever take it with you back out to that parking lot. Today is a new day. God has given you a new start. This is an opportunity to start again. How many are glad for the God of second chances? How about third, fourth, and hundredth chances? Thank you, God. You've given me a new morning. Every day your mercies are new. And so I'm going to come and I'm going to bring all of my burdens. I'm going to bring all of my junk, all of my pain, all of my strain. I'm going to leave it at the altar. That's what worship is all about. It it, it certainly is all about God. But here's what God wants to do is he wants to lift the heavy burden off of you during worship. Did you know that God wants to make a trade with you? Did you know God's a wheeler dealer? He's a wheel and dealing God. He said it in his word. I'll trade you that spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise. How many wants to make that trade today? How many wants to go enter into that kind of transaction with God? God, I'll give you my spirit of heaviness. What are you going to give me for it? He said, I'll give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But so often, because we're stubborn, because we're proud, because we get arrogant, because we know we're right and we know they're wrong. We hold on to the offense. We fight with our brothers and sisters and we think that we're justified in our anger and that we're going to pay them back, that we're going to get a pound of flesh for the little offense that they did for us. And what God is saying is you've not entered into agreement with me. You've not entered into my deal. And my ways are always better. My ways are perfect. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways above your ways. And God says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. And if you think that you can get even better than God, you're wrong. God keeps really good records. And I'm so thankful that by the blood of Jesus, the handwriting of sin, The handwriting of offenses against me has been blotted out. It has been cast into the sea of forgetfulness and it will never, ever, ever be brought up against me again. If that's you, say amen. Amen. I have been forgiven. I have been redeemed. And therefore, because I have been forgiven such a great debt, why would I want to squabble with my brothers and sisters and not enter in to the place of peace? Look at verse two. It says, of unity. When it says it, it's talking about unity. We have to go back to the first verse. What's the theme of this? It's unity. It is like precious oil upon the head. What is it? Unity. Let's just replace that word and say unity is like, it's not, but it's like, it's a simile here. It's comparing. Unity is like precious oil on the head running down on the beard. What beard? The beard of Aaron, who was Aaron. He was the priest. He was the one called by God to go between, to be the mediator for man and God, for people. Aaron was the priest. He was the mediator. Old Testament, Old Covenant, there was one person that could go before the the Holy of Holies one time a year and make atonement for sin. Now, can you imagine having to wait an entire year to get your sin remitted? That's what they were under. These people were under the kind of law that there was one mediator and only that person could go once a year into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for sin. Wouldn't it be terrible to be that person that sinned on the very first day of the new year? I got to live with that for 364 more days. But thanks be to God that the veil has been torn, that we have direct access. We have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was like us in all ways, tempted, but yet he was without sin. And we can come boldly today to the throne of grace to receive mercy and help in our time of need. You don't have to wait. 
You don't have to wait for next week to get the culmination of this message. You don't have to wait till next year in order to ask forgiveness. You can come today just like you are and release it to God. His blood was enough. It talks about Aaron and his anointing. The unity is like this precious anointing oil. What else does it say? It says it ran down on the edge of his garments. I see a theme here. The woman who had an issue of blood had a need so deep that all the doctors could not fulfill. She had spent all the money that she had and finally faith arose to the point where she said, if I can just touch but the edge of his garment, the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Why did the oil, the costly anointed oil go down on his head, down to his beard, onto his priestly garments? It was because the flow of the anointing always goes down to where the need is the greatest. They would fill up a horn, a ram's horn, they put oil in there and they would anoint people for service. And we're not talking about just a little dab of do you on your forehead, a little cross sign on your forehead. We're talking about a deluge of oil that would anoint them to the point where they were lathered with oil. There was an aroma to that oil. There was a sight to that oil. There was a shimmering sign to that oil. There was something that was designated different about the priest because they had been anointed by God. And here's what they're saying is that the anointing oil is like Unity And unity, when we all get together, one mind and one purpose, I, I remember reading somewhere that they were all in one mind and one accord and something happened. Suddenly there was a shaking in the house and the heavens ran and the spirit of God came down like a dove, like a mighty fire. And they all were baptized and began to speak in other tongues. This is the descending of the Spirit of God. And it was proof positive that Jesus had made it back to the Father. And he sent forth the helper, the precious Spirit of God. You know why the enemy does not want you and I to get unified? Number one, there's a commanded blessing to unity. But number two, that's how the entire world was turned upside down by the original apostles and disciples in the first century because they were all in one accord. They were all of one mind, thought, and purpose. I remember an old gospel song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, I would say, get together, <laughs> what a day of rejoicing that will be. Unity is like the precious anointing oil going down on his garments. Oil, oil in this day that this was written had multiple purposes. It was used for preparation of food. It was used for pre preservation of, of uh, animal skins. It was used to light a, a, uh, a, a, a lamp so that they could see at night. Oil was also used as a way to ward off bad things that would come to infest and to torment their animals. The psalmist said it like this, thou anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. What's he talking about? Well, the psalmist knew that there was in this sheep herd a, a, a parasite a pestilence that would get into the ears of the sheep at a certain time of the year. And so as a way to ward off that, that pestilence and to get rid of those gnats, the shepherd, a good shepherd, would take oil and would put oil on the heads of the sheep and would rub the sheep so that they would be able to not have those irritants in their ears. Also, as the sheep would go around the crags of the rock, there would be jagged areas that would reach out and would get, grab their wool and it would hurt and it would hang them up. But if the good shepherd would put oil over those sheep, then they could easily traverse all of those pathways. They could easily get around the crags of the rock. They could easily not be offended by those little things sticking out that would reg regularly cause us to be caught up. And so when you get anointed by God, when the anointing oil comes on you like unity in a house, then there are things that used to really they hang you up, but now all of a sudden they just brush you off. You can just let it roll off because you are anointed. 
And it speaks another thing to us. This priestly anointing in the old covenant was just one person. This was a caste system. One person at a time could be the high priest. There was only a, a certain family lineage that even qualified to be in this number. There, there were only uh, the sons of, of Aaron that could even be anointed as priest. That's old covenant. How many are glad we're in the new covenant? For we are now kings and priests unto our God. And so what this is saying is that as we bring this into our vernacular, when we have unity, then we become priests unto God and also priests to one another. Well, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I mean this, that we are to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will availeth much. And that means I need you and you need me. Because at times that I'm down, you may be up. At times that I'm weak, you may be strong. And there are times where I have to rub off on your anointing because I need a little bit extra help today. And there's times where I'm going to have a little bit more opportunity to help you. And we need each other. Just look at your neighbor and say, I need you. I can't do this alone. I need you. You need me. We need to be in connection and in community with one another. And this unity brings forth an anointing for a blessing. But that's not all. It says, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. It, again, is unity. What is like the dew? Unity. What is like anointing oil? Unity. So unity is like the dew of Hermon. Now, dew reduces stress for plants. Get this, they knew exactly what they were writing, okay? This is a farming, agricultural kind of community. They knew what it was like to have plants and what plants needed. And dew reduces stress for plants and it forms a protective barrier over the leaf. Hear me, Here, here's what dew is all about. You can wake up this time of the year and there's a little bit of stuff on the grass that's wet. What do we call that? It's dew. Well, we, we can get our feet just a little bit wet with the dew in our yard. But the dew of Hermon, where, where this mountain is located, it's the highest peak in the entire region. And all of the native travelers understood that if you were to spend overnight in that mountain, at the certain elevation where the dew settles in, that dew is a whole lot more heavy than what you get on your grass and your plants. You would wake up the next morning totally drenched with wetness, like it had rained, though it hadn't rained. Because the dew is so heavy in that area, but it serves a purpose for the plants in that region. What does it do? It reduces the stress on the plant and it performs a protective covering over its leaves for a time. What does unity do? Unity reduces stress from my life and yours. Oh, listen, unity in the church reduces stress on the preacher's life for sure. When there's fighting and complaining and grumbling and strife and, and turmoil, look, I earned these grays, all right? I earned them, every one of them. And some of them was at home and some of them's away from home, like here. <laughs> Unity reduces stress, but it also provides a protective covering. How many want to be protected by the Lord? I pray God's protection over you. I pray God's protection over my family. I pray God's protection over my life. I want the protective barrier of God like a dew that settles upon my life. See, leaves of a plant have a process called transpiration. And transpiration is when the water releases out of the leaf. Water in scripture is always a sign of life. And so with every bit of transpiration, every bit of life that leaks out of that plant, there's a little bit of something that it loses, but then the dew settles back on it or the rains come and it gets life again. And so that tells us that you and I as Christians in unity are not to be like a dead sea. We don't just hoard up everything that is given to us. We want to be like the Sea of Galilee. We want to have an outlet. We want to be a living body of water. And when the dew settles upon you, it is for the purpose of a protective barrier. When you're out of unity, you have no protection. Because I know this of your life like I know it of mine. Like a plant's leaf, we have little tiny holes in our life. 
That's right. We are leaking all of the time. We don't necessarily recognize it, but we are leaking all day long. We are leaking out of our energy. Our emotions leak out. Our frustrations leak out. Our joys leak out. Our pain leaks out. Our life is filled with little tiny holes. That's why they they say in leadership classes that vision leaks and mission creeps. I'll say it again. Vision leaks and mission creeps. You ever gotten so excited about something in life? You, you've got a vision to start a business, to, to do something as a project at home, to, to get involved in a ministry, to, to do something for God. There's this great vision. And it's wonderful in the moment that it was transmitted to you. But as you start to walk it out and you realize, well, that's going to take time. That's going to cost money. That's going to be investment. I'm going to have to recruit people. I'm going to have to actually build some of this stuff myself. Then vision can start to leak out of us. And what started out as such a grandiose idea now all of a sudden has gotten a little stale. That's because vision leaks. And if you're not careful, especially in the context of getting people rallied around a certain point, that your mission can creep. What used to be a narrow uh, vision, a a laser beam focus, now has become a murky swamp. And you really don't even know why you do what you do because your mission has crept so much. This happens particularly a lot in, in a local church. People will come up to the pastor and they'll say, Pastor, I think that we ought to go downtown and we ought to feed the homeless. That's wonderful. And what they just, mainly what they do is they take the burden of their vision, they put it on the pastor and the staff and say, that's what we pay y'all for, go and do that. And so we take that over and we do that. And we, first, first meeting we have, we have 25 people that show up. The next month, there's about 15. The next month, there's about five. And then finally, it's the pastor and the staff that are doing all that. And what happened is our mission has crept. It's not that that was a bad thing. It's that the original vision leaked out and the mission crept larger than what we could sustain. And so that's what worship does, is it brings us back into focus. Where in your life has your your vision leaked out? What in your life, your emotions, your passions, your desires, those things which you committed to long ago, where has it leaked out? The dew of unity provides a protective barrier over your life that transpiration, that leaking doesn't happen until the right time. So what is unity? It's like oil. What is unity? It's like dew. It's a protective agent that helps me to stay on mission with what God has called me to do. The next verse here, at the end of Psalm 133, it says, for there, where? For there, Where? The place of unity. For there, the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. For there, in that place of unity, the Lord commanded the blessing. What is the blessed life? You ever ask yourself, what what is the blessed life? What does it mean to be blessed? Now, Now, in Western culture, The blessed life sounds and looks like having a lot of possessions, having a lot of stuff. But the blessed life is actually not being disjointed. It's being in community with one another. Some people think that a blessed life means just more accumulation. But studies actually tell us that when a family reaches $75,000 in annual income, the satisfaction of their life never goes up, regardless of how much more they make beyond that. And if those who make $34,000 in a year find themselves in the category of the top 1%, hear me, of wage earners in the entire world. So by demographics in 45036 Warren County, Ohio, we are comprised of a whole lot of rich people. This perspective now is brought to, by the psalmist. It involves sacrifice. It involves bringing something to the Lord. And there are some commands like unity, and then there are some suggestions of wisdom. Now, here are some things that Jesus said which are not, hear me, they're not suggestions. They're, I mean, they're, they're not commands. They're, they're kind of like wisdom suggestions. Jesus said things like this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus didn't command you to give. He said, but it's more blessed to do that than to be the receiver. 
Jesus said, you cannot serve God and money. It's not a command. It is, this is life wisdom. Life does not exist in the abundance of possessions. Jesus is giving them wisdom that the blessed life is not about things. But 1 Timothy wraps it up and I'll close. It says, 1 Timothy 6, command those who are rich in this present world. Who's rich? In our zip code, just about every household, the majority of households in our zip code would be classified as rich. See, it's easy to always look at someone else as rich. Someone has more money as rich. No, you are richly blessed by God today. So command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth or that is uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. See, God's not against you having stuff. He, he's provided you stuff for your enjoyment. What God is interested in is, does your stuff have you? Are you so abundantly blessed that you can no longer fit out time in your week to come and be in the house of God and worship God and be in unity with the saints and come at a time to rest your soul and Sabbath your life? Some people have gotten so blessed by their possessions that I regret praying for them years ago that their business would prosper because when their business prospered, they didn't show up. They got too blessed. Command them to do good and be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Wait a minute. We're not just living for this life. No, there is this life and the life to come, the coming age, so that they may lay hold of life that is truly life. There are people who are alive, but they're not living the real, true life. They're going through the motions. They're heaping up for themselves all of the, the pleasures that this world can offer. And yet with every purchase, there is just a momentary sense of enjoyment. And then when the first payment comes due, all of a sudden that joy has worn off. Why? Because that's not true life. It's not in the abundance of possessions. It is in being unified first and foremost with God, having your right relationship vertically to God, and then horizontally with people. When Jesus was on that cross beam, he was looking up to the father, making peace for the punishment of sin to his father. And his arms are stretched out wide to say, you all now have access to be in unity to the father. With heads bowed and no one looking around between you and God today. Are you unified to the Lord? Do you have unity in your heart with Jesus today? Are you getting along with other people? Or when I was talking just a moment ago, or there's some people that were coming to mind that you remember you have ought with them. You know what Jesus said is that if you remember that your brother has something against you, when you come to a place of worship, leave your gift right there and go and make peace with them and then come and offer your gift. In other words, what he's saying is that your worship will not be effective as it could be until you make things right with God and with people. And maybe that's you today and you wanna pray. I'm gonna say a prayer, you can repeat it after me. You can say it in your heart, but I'll tell you there is something about verbalizing it with your mouth. I'm gonna ask everyone who will to pray this prayer out loud. You might just encourage someone next to you to pray it who otherwise would not. Say this with me, dear God, I come to you today. I'm broken. I have messed up. I need unity in my life. I want to make things right with you first, God. And I want to be at unity with other people. Forgive me, God. I repent. I say yes to Jesus. I will follow you as you show me how. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.